Welcome to Nutrition Rounds with Dr. Danielle Bellardo, the podcast for anyone interested in learning about plant-based nutrition through an evidence-based approach. Every week, we share insights and interviews with physicians who are leading experts in nutrition and health. Whether you've been plant-based for many years or are still searching for the perfect diet, Nutrition Rounds will inspire and empower you to live your healthiest life backed by science. Now here's your host, Dr. Danielle Bellardo, MD. Hello, hello. You are on Nutrition Rounds with Danielle Bellardo, MD, and today's guest is a friend of mine, Shivam Joshi, MD. He is an internal medicine physician and nephrologist. He's practicing at Bellevue Hospital in New York City. He is a faculty member of NYU School of Medicine with research interests in popular diets and nephrology. He received his BS from Duke and his MD from the University of Miami. He completed his internal medicine residency at Jackson Memorial Hospital at the University of Miami and his fellowship in nephrology at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. He is on Twitter as SJoshiMD and as well as Facebook, Instagram, and he has a website where he does shares a lot of information about plant-based nutrition, um, afternoonrounds.com. Hi, Shavam. Hey, Daniel. Thank you again for having me. I, I'm so excited to talk all things kidney and plant-based diets with you. Me too. I'm so pumped. I, I was just, uh, before we started recording, me and um, Shavon were just chatting about how popular this topic was and how so many of you are interested in learning how nutrition can help with various kinds of kidney disease. And I think it's really, really, really important that we discuss it because it seems to be like a popular topic everyone's been asking about. Absolutely. It's a very important topic and we don't talk about it enough, both in the, the lay media and also in our professional societies. For sure. Okay. So why don't we start with just how did you become a kidney doctor with an interest in prevention? Yeah. So it's kind of a long story. I think I started out being you know, someone not interested in prevention and I was actually very interested in kidney transplantation. Uh, I, I thought it was very fascinating putting a kidney into someone who was on kidney failure. And, and uh, there's so many issues related to it, like, uh, like diets. So there's a lot of controversy and problems. So like with transplants, not everyone can get one. And if you don't get one, uh, the survival rate uh, with kidney failure is actually terrible. It's around 45% at five years, meaning wow. that more than half of people, yeah, uh, passed away uh, on dialysis. And uh, that number increases as you get older, unfortunately. And uh, if you're on dialysis, you can't go to work, you can't stay in school. And uh, it really brings into the question, are you alive or are you dead? Because you're kind of connected to a machine, but you really aren't fully living your life. And just to give you some numbers here, um, about uh, 468,000 people are on dialysis, but only 21,000 people each year get kidney transplants. And that doesn't even cover number of people that develop kidney failure each year, which is 117,000. So you can really see there's a, a huge gap. And then uh, uh, people say, well, you know, you can always get a live donor kidney transplant, meaning that in, when you have kidney failure and you're on dialysis, uh, your options are to go on a wait list and get a uh, kidney from someone who passed away, unfortunately, like in a car accident. Uh, but there's a lot of people on the wait list and the wait list is anywhere from three to five years. In Florida, it's a little bit better. Uh, which is where I'm from. But if you're in New York, which is where I currently live, it's a little bit worse towards the, the five-year mark. And then uh, some people say, well, if you know someone can give you a kidney, then easy peasy. You get the kidney from a friend or a family member and you're on your way. But the thing is that the kidney has to match. You have to know someone. They have to be healthy. They have to like you enough to give you a kidney, True. Uh, which is no easy task. And then uh, it also requ requires resources. Even if you get everything else done, people uh, have a hard time doing this because they have fears about uh, uh, donating kidney, which the practice is extremely safe, but uh, they may need to take time off from work, for example, or they may need to rent a hotel or drive to the transplant center. These things add up and people have discussed this extensively. And there's these barriers for people that don't have as much resources uh, in, uh, in donating kidney and, and ultimately affects people in getting a kidney. So it's actually pretty difficult. So back when I was in med school, I was very interested in all of this, and I found this extremely fascinating, and I threw myself into it, and I was working, and I was publishing, and I was working with a transplant nephrologist and a transplant surgeon, 
And, uh, and then ultimately after med school, I took some time off to actually work on a couple projects to make an artificial kidney, which uh, I was young and naive and I was full of life and energy. I'm still, I still am that, but uh, 10 years goes by fast. But I, I was working on these artificial kidneys and then um, these, these projects, which a lot of people have hope in, and we certainly hope that they come to, to life. Uh, but uh, uh, they still have a lot of challenges to go through. So although we keep hoping that you know, maybe we can make an artificial kidney that we can put inside someone like a robotic kidney or something like that, the timeline is, is, still, is still not anything close for anyone on the wait list right now. So I guess the big goal would be to obviously uh, prevent kidney disease and you know prevent patients from even going into end-stage renal disease where they require kidney transplant. So I think that these statistics are shocking. I mean, the fact that annually 117,000 new cases of kidney failure uh, are diagnosed is, is unbelievable. And so can we start talking about the main causes of end-stage renal disease and, and kidney disease? And if you don't mind just kind of explaining from the beginning, what, what do the kidneys even do? Yeah, sure. Ab- absolutely. So, so it was in this thought process when I was doing uh, research and trying to figure out my life when the light bulb, so to speak, kind of just went off. And I realized that the number one and number two cause of both kidney disease and then kidney failure itself is diabetes and hypertension, respectively. And then both of these diseases are preventable uh, for the most part, type 2 diabetes and then hypertension caused by uh, lifestyle uh, indiscretion. Uh, So these diseases need not happen. They need not progress and they need not lead to kidney disease or even end stage kidney disease, which is kidney failure. And uh, yeah, so we should talk about what the kidneys do. So the kidneys, you have two of them in the body and they're both about the size of a fist or say a Coke can and they filter the blood. Um, they filter about 140 liters of blood per day and to make one to two liters of urine. The blood you need, so you keep the blood with you, but the urine you don't, that's why people go to the bathroom and urinate. And uh, the, the, all that, all the, the urine contains toxins, extra water, salt, things that you don't need. So a simple way to understand what the kidneys do is that if your kidneys don't work, that urine essentially accumulates in your blood. And you can easily see how that would be problematic because that urine is full of bad things that your body doesn't need. And so someone that's on dialysis, they essentially require a machine to do that. Uh, They're connected to a machine three times a week, four hours each time. And uh, the machine essentially does the filtration and removes that so the so-called urine uh, from the blood. Um, And that's what it does. It does also does other things. It regulates, uh, electrolytes like sodium and potassium. And um, as I mentioned, it uh, prevents you from being swollen or too dehydrated. It also makes the kidneys make hormones. They also regulate even how much blood you have in your body. Uh, They do a lot of things. And uh, the kidney itself is made of about a million nephrons, uh, which is where the term for field comes from, nephrology. And nephrons are these tiny microscopic filtering units. So if you look under a microscope, you're going to see about a million of these filtration units under and under a microscope, and this is what comprises a kidney. And uh, uh, within a nephron, there's two components called the glomerulus, uh, which people might have heard before when they get their kidneys checked, because there's a little number that comes next to a, an abbreviation called the GFR, which stands for the glomerular filtration rate, which refers to how much blood is going through the glomerulus and being filtered through it. And then uh, next to the glomerulus, what's connected to it are tubules, which kind of function as pumps to uh, to reclaim either water or just the pH of your blood or reabsorb uh, certain electrolytes like sodium or potassium. So that's essentially what the, the kidneys do. And they're connected to ureters, which are tiny tubules that go to the bladder. And then the bladder stores urine until a socially appropriate time and place where you can urinate. The kidneys are so important. And as physicians, um, even though I'm board certified in internal medicine, you know, I definitely have so much respect for nephrologists and for people that go into subspecialty training in nephrology. It's a, it's a very complicated organ that doesn't get the respect, I think, that the heart gets and the brain. And I think that sometimes patients don't get as alarmed when their kidneys start to get sick as they do when they find out that they have heart failure or, you know, a stroke. And I think that it's 
I don't want to use the term underrated, but I think that we do oftentimes in medicine and even with patients underscore how important it is to get on top of kidney disease in the beginning and how even as physicians, um, as you know, and now I'm a cardiology fellow. And so obviously I co-manage a lot of patients with nephrology, but even internists referring to a patient to a nephrologist early is so important and getting ahead of kidney disease early is so important. And we talk about prevention in a lot of other areas in heart disease and in, you know, lung disease, quitting smoking, all these lifestyle modifications. But I'm really glad today we can talk about lifestyle modification and prevention and reversing disease in terms of the kidney, this organ that doesn't get the attention it deserves. I totally agree with you. Um, uh, People kind of ignore the kidney or leave it on the back burner. And I I think that's for a lot of reasons. The idea of just dropping dead from a heart attack is so strong and compelling. and, And there's been a lot of momentum. And this is kudos to cardiology societies and your profession as a whole for for bringing to attention heart disease, which has been and continues to be the number one killer, which is interesting because uh, I agree with you. Prevention is is absolutely important, and you, and I think any specialist will tell you that which regarding which organ. But what people don't realize is that, as you mentioned, having kidney disease is serious because most people with kidney disease don't make it to dialysis. It's because they die before they get to dialysis. And they actually die of heart disease, which is why we need right, smart people like yourself. And like you. And and so I'm <laughs> I'm so glad. So today we are, everyone is going to get, uh, those kidneys are going to get the attention they deserve. So thank you so much. So going back to the kidney. So I would love to talk about, we talked about diabetes a lot on this podcast, and I would love for you to explain for everyone how diabetes, one of the big causes of chronic kidney disease, how diabetes does affect the kidney. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, diabetes is the number one cause of both chronic kidney disease and for end-stage renal disease. So I should probably explain those those concepts. So, So chronic kidney disease has five stages, the first stage being the most mild stage, and then it progresses all the way down uh, to stage five. And and this is graded according to that number, the, the according to the GFR, the glomerular filtration rate. And as your glomerular filtration rate decreases, kidney function decreases. And this is often seen in a rise in, in the creatinine, which is what we measure in the blood. And, uh, and sometimes these concepts get confusing when I'm explaining to patients because people think that the GFR is decreasing, so that's good, but it's actually bad. It means that your, your kidney is filtering less. And then the creatinine is going up, and that, that is also bad. And once you get to stage five, you can end up on dialysis, and that's called the end stage, kidney disease or kidney failure. And diabetes is number one cause for both. And about a third, a little more than that, 35% of patients with diabetes develop kidney problems over time. And this number is about the same whether you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Uh, The numbers fluctuate a little bit depending on the study, but roughly it's about a third of patients. It's impressive. Yeah. And given that diabetes is increasing worldwide, people are saying that the number of people who will have kidney problems because of it is also increasing. So that's unfortunate. And the, uh, the biggest thing that affects uh, your likelihood of developing kidney problems is the amount of time you have diabetes and your control of the diabetes during the time, meaning how high your blood sugars were during the time that you had the diabetes. So you can easily see that if you have diabetes, the best thing is to not have it or get rid of it. And then if you can't get rid of it is to keep it as under good control as you can. And for the, the physicians out there, the, the studies that, that support that, there was two big studies, um, the DCCT EDIC study, which uh, looked at people with type 1 diabetes and those who had uh, better uh, control of their sugars, down, according to hemoglobin A1C, that's a three-month average. People who had a control of their blood sugars less than, seven, less than or equal to 7% had a reduced nine-year risk of developing kidney problems, namely protein in the urine, which is one of the first signs of developing kidney dysfunction. It's actually called uh, micro macroalbuminuria, uh, which the society is trying to get away from and just they're just calling it albuminuria. And then this was, and they continue to show this after 22 years. And, uh, and then there was another study called the UK PDS, which essentially showed the same thing for people with type 2 diabetes. And so this is why we emphasize great diabetes control for people who haven't yet developed kidney problems. 
the evidence isn't as great for people who ha already have the kidney problems. So that's why we don't pursue as aggressively because of the risk of side effects with hypoglycemia. But the current thinking is that's still better not to be uncontrolled, obviously. In U UK PDS, uh, after 10 years of patients being on intensive control for type 2 diabetes, targeting hemoglobin A1C less than 7%, there was a 24% reduction in the development of microvascular, meaning small vessel disease, which includes kidney disease compared to those who, who are on conventional therapy. And then 12-year data showed that intensive glycemic control, again, less than 7% hemoglobin A1C re resulted in a 33% reduction in the risk of developing a microproteinuria or clinical grade proteinuria and a significant reduction in the proportion of patients with doubling of blood creatinine level, basically a 50% uh, decline in kidney function uh, compared to those who were, again, treated on uh, the conventional standards. That's so interesting because it's it really like highlights these trials you mentioned in both type one and type two diabetes. It really highlights the importance of control of diabetes um, with in whatever way possible. Yeah, and and there's a, there's a great review by Catherine Tuttle and C. Jason in 2017. She talks about all this information and what she tells you, what she says, and I, I didn't uh, fully appreciate this is that if you have diabetes you want to get it under control as soon as possible because there's this legacy effect, meaning that the control that you have now affects your risk for developing problems with kidney disease down the line. So people that have in, early, in, the, in the early portion of their disease have uncontrolled diabetes, those people tend to do worse compared to those people who don't have this uh, wildly uncontrolled uh, diabetes in the early portion of the disease. It's, it's almost like a memory effect on, on the kidney. And it's really interesting. So um, for people that have this ongoing interest, I, I highly recommend uh, finding her review. And uh, and yeah, so we could talk about how how diabetes affects the kidney. Yeah, that would be interesting that if we could cover the pathophysiology of that, because I think even as clinicians, as physicians, we kind of don't always remember exactly how diabetes is so, and for the patients out there who have diabetes, to kind of understand the mechanism of how it does affect the kidneys. Right. So the, ma the main mechanism that how diabetes affects the kidney is through hyperfiltration. It, it, like the word suggests, it refers to more blood being filtered through the glomerulus. And uh, this is essentially like revving up the kidney. It's kind of like redlining an engine or someone overworking themselves, say, to meet a deadline. But imagine this happens 24-7. And as you can see, that this ultimately leads to bad things happening. So it was an engine, maybe your engine might wear out. And in this case, we're talking about the kidney, and we start to see changes in the kidney. The first, the first change is that you get this thickening of the, of the actual filtration membrane, the glomerular basement membrane, and that thickens, we think, as a result of this increased uh, uh, blood flow going to the kidney. So the question is, why, does, why is there more blood flow going to the kidney? And there's two reasons. One is that the high sugars, uh, hyperglycemia causes this, and we'll, which, which makes sense. But what people don't know, in, uh, and in the, that review article by uh, Catherine Tuttle, she talks about this, is that hyperamino acidemia, meaning excess protein in the blood, this also contributes to increased blood flow in the kidney. And people think that combined, these things lead to a detrimental effect. And you can reverse this by either lowering your blood sugars, or as you can imagine, by reducing the amount of protein that you eat. And this is this brings into a huge Pandora's box of questions and issues related to protein. And most people think that there is a benefit by re reducing protein intake if you already have kidney problems. And we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, but I, I just but I just want to give a get glancing blow right now. And um, uh, this is why, they, the, why people with diabetes have bigger kidneys. They teach you in med school that if someone has large kidneys, to wonder about diabetes or affect it. The reason being is because they're getting so much blood to the kidneys. That hyperfiltration is happening to each one of those million nephrons in each kidney. And if you multiply that small increase in blood by a million, the kidneys increase by a couple centimeters. And that's why you get enlarged kidneys, which is really interesting. It's really interesting. Yeah. So then the, the other change that happened in the kidney is that you get glycation of matrix, matrix proteins, which leads to what we call mesangial expansion within the kidney. So basically, the excess sugars in, in the blood uh, attach themselves to normal floating proteins, and these proteins deposit within portions of the kidney. Kind of, um, if you think of the filters having support structures and beams, 
those support structures and beams of the filter become enlarged or expanded. That's what we call mesangial expansion. That's fascinating. I'm so, I'm like so pumped to hear the actual molecular process. So increased blood sugar in the blood, correct me if I'm getting this right, increased blood sugar in the blood, we have poorly controlled hemoglobin A1C and poorly controlled glycosylate hemoglobin all over the body. And then the more excess sugar you have causes increased glycation of these important proteins like the, that cause this mesangial expansion. So theoretically, or in practicality, you can clarify, essentially, if you improve your blood glucose control, you should be able to decrease this glycation of the matrix proteins? Yeah, exactly. I, we, we think so. Um, we think that some of these changes are reversible. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a, a little bit later. One of your, I, I've saved that question because uh, one of your followers asked that, and I put that in the, the follower questions, which is very interesting. Great. But I, I'm going to table that to keep some, some suspense. Excellent. So, <laughs> so um, uh, the, the other change that happens is that you get this highland narrowing of the blood vessels. Essentially, they increase blood sugars, uh, again, cause changes in the blood vessels themselves and cause a little bit of narrowing, which reduces the amount of blood flow to the kidneys. And then finally, you get pr- the glycation of these proteins. Eventually, they can uh, be maladaptive and form what we call advanced glycation end products, which cause damage. And then diabetes is thought to increase angiotensin II, which is a hormone that is associated with increased blood pressure, and cytokines, uh, which then also affect kidney disease. And the other thing is that people with obesity, uh, people with diabetes tend to be obese, and then obesity in itself also causes this hyperfiltration phenomenon. So there's a lot of ways that diabetes and being overweight and the foods that we eat all affect the kidney. We don't, we don't think of it that much. So when you look at it under a microscope, you'll see, like I said, the, the thickening of the basement membrane, kind of like the, the, the sieve portion of, of that uh, filter that I was talking about. And then you get the expansion of the, the support structures that keep the filter upright and in place. And then you can also get these nodules that form. And then as the nodules progress, you get scarring, and then your, your, your kidney essentially becomes uh, fibrotic and non-functional. And, uh, and then um, the other, the number two cause of both kidney disease and kidney failure is high blood pressure. So we should talk about how that does damage to the kidney because that's very important too. Absolutely. So uh, again, about a third of people with high blood pressure develop kidney problems. So wow, about a third. Wow. A third, right. And if you think about how, how many people get high blood pressure, the number increases with age and approaches 80 to 90% of people, especially uh, certain uh, minorities. And then uh, men, uh, it approaches 80, 80 90% with ages 80, around 80 or 90 years. And, uh, and if you think about it, a third of those people with high blood pressure will have kidney problems. It's not surprising because like blood sugar, which travels to basically all parts of the body, high blood pressure travels wherever blood goes. And that's all parts of the body. And some parts of the body are more sensitive to that than others, and the kidney being one of those parts. I mean, this is really, I'm really glad you're touching on this because blood, hypertension is a big overlap between nephrology and cardiovascular disease. And there's an estimated 103 million US adults with high blood pressure. And I mean, that's nearly half of all adults in the United States have hypertension. It's incredible. So it's, it really affects a large population of people. And, and additionally, they're finding that as this amount of hypertension increases and how it's becoming, you know, more and more common, the death rate from high blood pressure increased to nearly 11% in the United States, increased by nearly 11% between 2005 and 2015. Um, The actual number of deaths also rose by almost 38%. So it's just, it's just unbelievable. You know, high blood pressure affects nearly a third of adults and is the most common cause of cardiovascular disease related deaths. And it's just, it's very, very, very frightening. It, it is frightening. And you're absolutely right. Uh, half of adults currently today have high blood pressure. And then if, if you're at the age of 45 and you don't have high blood pressure, your 40 year risk of developing high blood pressure is 84 to 93 um, percent, percent, wow. which is, yeah, which is uh, astounding. So, and people think that it, uh, developing high blood pressure is a natural part of aging. 
uh, but that's uh, not totally true. We, we have studies from rural societies showing that people age uh, into their 60s and beyond, and their blood pressure stay the same or normal. So and we have good evidence that uh, that blood pressure is a lifestyle disease, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about momentarily, but to, to, uh, to not jump ahead. So why does high blood pressure cause kidney problems? Well, it, it's, it literally is the high blood pressure. That increased pressure causes damage. Uh, if you think of any sort of pump or filter, like a, a pump in a, a pool, and imagine if you have a lot of pressure in there, you know, you could, you're soon going to start seeing mechanical problems. And it's very similar to the kidney, that the, the kidney is sensitive to these changes and damage happens. The other way, the, the, what happens is that you get narrowing of the arteries and arterioles. The, the, basically, the blood vessels within the kidney become thicker to basically support the pressure. It's kind of like if you have a pipe in, the, in, your, in your pool pump, those pipes become thicker or become reinforced. But what happens is that they don't reinforce outwards, they reinforce kind of inwards, which reduces actually the amount of blood going to the kidney. So some people even say that the damage from high blood pressure to the kidney is actually because of not enough times this, uh, and then when you get go down this pathway, and then you're not getting enough blood and you get kidney damage and you develop CKD, that in itself then causes blood pressure to go even higher, higher and then it can start like this uh, cyclical process with uh, raising the blood pressure higher, causing kidney damage, both feed into each other. So uh, high blood pressure affects all parts of the body. It just affects the heart, it affects the brain, and it certainly affects the kidney. And the treatment for this is to lower blood pressure, take blood pressure medications. Obviously, if you, if you, have, uh, if you don't have kidney disease, there's a number of medications you can take. You can take what we call thiazide diuretics. A lot of people are on them like HCTZ or chlordaldone. You can be on a beta blocker. You can be on a calcium channel blocker. Uh, but you can also be on an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker like lisinopril or losartan. And those medications have the double benefit of reducing the amount of protein in the urine. They, have, they, they reduce proteinuria. Uh, and they, they perform better in doing that uh, than other medications used for blood pressure. And they also uh, reduce the progression of chronic kidney disease. So this is why they're a preferred medication for people with kidney problems. For people with diabetes, there's a, a new class of drugs called the SGLT2 inhibitors that just came out, which uh, function to uh, prevent the reabsorption of, of glucose in the proximal tubule of the glomerulus of the, of the nephron. And uh, they have the added benefit of reducing hyperfiltration. So that's why I think they're so beneficial. This was actually presented at ACC as well. Um, there's a lot that's happening with the SGLT2 um, inhibitors um, in cardiovascular disease um, as well. It's really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. The, these medications, yeah, this class of medications is, is like the, the ACE inhibitor and the ARBs that, uh, that developed in the 80s and 90s. This is, this is uh, almost a game-changing drug. Unfortunately, they are expensive and we don't have all the data out, but with each year, there's more and more data coming out in support of the drugs. One great trial that came out at ACC is DECLARE, um, and it's um, essentially it was a study with dapagliflozin, which is uh, an SGLT2 inhibitor. It was a 17,000-person study, and they showed that the um, SGLT2 inhibitor reduced hospitalization for patients with heart failure with and without reduced ejection fraction. Oh, so wow. this was really important because HEFPEF, um, as you probably know, is something that, you know, we don't have a lot of data and evidence for. It's been something that we just kind of go forward with treating the heart rate, try to keep patients euvolemic. And this was a really interesting trial. It was essentially, so the SGLT2 inhibitors are making their way in primary prevention. And I, I think it's an interesting medication. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I am excited for them. And I, I look forward to, to seeing more evidence come out in support of them. So going, going back to high blood pressure. So uh, treatment, as I mentioned, uh, any number of medications, diuretics, uh, like I mentioned, like the thiazide diuretics work by increasing the amount of salt that you urinate. And uh, salt uh, raises blood pressure. This is why we tell people to limit the amount of salt they take in. And diuretics work by increasing the amount of salts, essentially uh, sodium chloride that you pee out, um, which as one can imagine will lower your blood pressure. 
And uh, salt reduction is really important. Um, as of recently, a lot of people have been asking me, oh, is Himalayan salt good for me? And I tell them no, because it <laughs> is still salt, even though it's pink and it's cool and attractive and it has like this mystique that's coming from the mountains. Uh, it is still sodium chloride. It will still raise your blood pressure. So please don't use Himalayan salt or sea salt or any kind of rock salt. Uh, these are all salts that will raise your blood pressure. Gotcha. So I think that it's actually really a great time for you to kind of just explain also how with regards for treatment for hypertension with diet, you know, kind of what your thoughts are about that. Because as everyone knows who's listening, you are plant-based and, and you are able to reverse a lot of your patients' diabetes and hypertension through plant-based nutrition. So what are your thoughts on diet modification as a big step in either in conjunction with medications or before patients require medications in plant-based diet for hypertension and diabetes? Yeah. So for most people, we think and we understand that diet and lifestyle uh, contribute to diabetes and hypertension. We think it's about 90% for both. For type 1 diabetes, unfortunately, it's an autoimmune disease. And I don't want to confuse anyone that it has type 1 diabetes or knows someone with type 1 diabetes to think that they can reverse their type 1 diabetes. But so when I talk about diabetes, it's generally type 2. And then the same way with high blood pressure, most people have high blood pressure that's related to being overweight or taking too much salt or not eating enough plant foods, which we'll talk about why they're so beneficial. So it's, it's really those things. And I encourage people to make these lifestyle changes by eating right and exercising it at every stage of their disease, whether borderline at risk or they don't have their diseases yet, or they have had the disease for a year or 10 years. I tell them it's still not too late to make these changes because they could potentially uh, improve how their diseases are controlled or how well they're controlled and potentially get off some medications, which I have seen some people. It doesn't work for everyone, um, but for some people who do it well and do it right, uh, it, it can be, be life-changing. Yeah, and uh, I, I won't uh, talk too much about uh, diet and diabetes, but what I will talk to, uh, more about is diet and hypertension because uh, the DASH diet, which was a great trial, and we're fortunate to have this information because we don't have these great trials for every aspect of plant-based diets as they relate to lifestyle disease, but for blood pressure, we do, and it's called the DASH, the DASH diet. The DASH diet, uh, most people don't know, was originally meant to be a plant-based diet. People that created the DASH diet were looking at uh, studies of people eating vegetarian and vegan diets in industrial societies. And they noticed that these people compared to other people within societies, uh, within the society were of lower blood pressure. They had a lower blood pressure. They had a lower incidence of hypertension. There was a lot of uh, comparison studies between different religious groups. They compared omnivorous, for example, omnivorous Mormons to vegan and vegetarian Seventh-day Adventists. And they show, were able to show this difference that people eating plant-based had lower blood pressures. So I quote that the diet design goals were to create patterns that would A, have the blood pressure lowering benefits of a vegetarian diet, yet contain enough animal products to make them palatable non-vegetarians. And this is from a paper uh, describing what were the intended design, what was the intended design of the DASH diet. So for people who don't know, the DASH diet was a randomized controlled trial. Uh, the first results were published in 1997 in the English Journal of Medicine. And it included 459 adults randomized to three diets. People were randomized to either a controlled diet, which was a standard American diet, a diet, quote unquote, rich in fruits and vegetables, but I will make the point that it was high in fat and it had a couple other nuances, which may not have actually made it the best diet to test. And then also the DASH diet, as we know, which was fruits, vegetables, and low fat dairy with a reduced saturated fat, total fat. And what they were able to show is that people uh, adhering to the DASH diet had the lowest lower blood pressure reduction. People on the quote-unquote fruit and vegetable diet, which again also had some nuances, which included uh, eating more beef, pork, and ham than the other two groups and also having more fat and oil than the uh, DASH diet are um, had intermediate results and the people who just stayed on the standard American diet had uh, the smallest decrease in blood pressure. The DASH diet was eventually repeated because they didn't look, really look at low salt intake. So the, the DASH diet was then repeated to include low salt. And they similarly showed that people on the DASH diet combined with eating a low salt diet showed the biggest benefit in blood pressure reduction. And uh, one of the questions that I get is, how much of a reduction can I see 
in my blood pressure if I adhere to a DASH diet that is also low in sodium. The important, is, the important part is doing both. And we finally have an answer. This came out in December of 2017 in the Journal of American College of Cardiology. This was a secondary analysis of the results of the DASH diet and DASH low sodium diet. And they compared people who had mild hypertension to moderate to severe. And people who had severe hypertension, which was classified as blood pressures greater than 150 over 90, which is a number we see all the time in the clinic. These people who adopted a DASH low sodium diet, which again is low in sodium and has a lot of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, these people saw a reduction in their blood pressure around 20.8 over 7.9 milligrams uh, millimeters of mercury, which is which is a lot. We're talking approximately 21 millimeters of mercury in your top number, a systolic blood pressure number, and eight millimeters of mercury in the bottom number, which is the diastolic blood pressure. So this is essentially the effect of several medications. This uh, this pronounced effect is more than any blood pressure medication by itself, which is truly astounding. So, so it, it just goes to show uh, the power of making these lifestyle changes. And uh, two studies that actually, um, for anyone out there that wants to, we won't get into now, but that anyone wants to look up and read about that show uh, an improvement in blood pressure with um, eating a more plant-based diet, the Cardia study and the Epic Oxford trial. They both really showed um, improvements in blood pressure with the more plant-forward you eat. I think that this is, I would have to say, for me being someone, you know, we both manage hypertension, you and I, and I manage hypertension with the hope as to prevent end organ, organ dysfunction for the heart and you obviously for the kidneys. And I noticed that Blood pressure is one of the first things that when my patients go plant-based, that they are able to reverse so quickly. It's unbelievable. If, if someone jumps straight into a whole food plant-based diet, I find that I almost have to keep them uh, monitored very closely because sometimes their blood pressure drops so fast, it's before their next follow-up and we need to start removing medications. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I am a big fan of those studies. People say that those studies were just population studies and um, you can't really make definitive uh, so, uh, conclusions about it. But what's interesting, the cardio study showed a dose-dependent relationship between plant right. food intake and decreasing incidence of elevated blood pressure. So if, there, if, if you are drawing inferences from epidemiologic studies, there is no better signal to see than a dose-dependent relationship because that is suggestive, even more suggestive, that there, that there is an, a true effect here. And, and the DASH diet ultimately tested that out. And, um, and uh, so I, I agree with both of those uh, studies that you mentioned. They're, they're great studies for anyone interested, the other one being the Epic Oxford study. So, well, thank you for explaining that. I, I think that's really, and I know we're going to get even further into plant-based nutrition with regards to kidney disease in general. Um, so I think that this is a good time we can go into some of the specific questions that some of our followers uh, had submitted for you. And shockingly, there were a ton. I mean, there are a lot of people out there that want to There were a about lot. Them. Yeah. So, so um, it is a popular topic. So we are going to try to get to um, as many as we can. So one of the first questions is, what is the evidence about TMAO and CKD? And the interesting thing about TMAO um, that I'm just going to touch on, so I'm very particularly interested in TMAO. I do a lot of reading about it, and I um, am hoping to incorporate it into my research here with arrhythmia. But specifically, I am having an entire episode soon that will be dedicated to the gut microbiome with several gut microbiome experts, and we'll be discussing TMAO. So um, I do think it's interesting because um, it keeps coming up. So uh, everyone who listens knows that TMAO is an important variable. So what are your thoughts about TMAO and CKD? Yeah, so TMAO also plays a role in kidney disease. So just a brief overview, TMAO is this compound that's produced in the gut um, by gut flora after people eat uh, foods that contain carnitine like red meat or choline like eggs, dairy, shellfish, and some fish. And uh, this produces TMAO uh, in the gut. But TMAO uh, does not appear people that eat uh, vegans or vegetarians human meat. So we think that the gut flora is different from those who habitually eat meat. And then TMAO also does not appear in those receiving antibiotics. The gut flora produces this compound called trimethylamine, which then converts is converted in the liver to TMAO, 
um, which in the cardiology literature has been shown to be uh, associated with atherosclerosis, heart attack, stroke, death, uh, and revascularization. In regards to kidney disease, people also think that TMAO is both a marker uh, of kidney dysfunction and also a toxin to the kidneys. So, they, so it's really interesting. They uh, TMAO levels rise in people with kidney disease. Um, they, they rise as your stage of kidney disease gets worse. Uh, with people, so people with an end stage renal disease have the highest levels compared to people that are at stage one CKD, for example. And then, and then, uh, people that have the highest levels of TMAO have been shown to, to have the, the, the lowest survival. And then TMAO levels decline. Uh, after getting a kidney transplant, if, if uh, you're so fortunate to get one. And what we also think is that these elevated levels of TMAO are, can affect uh, kidney disease. Uh, uh, they thought to promote renal injury and fibrosis and renal dysfunction. Uh, so uh, a lot of interesting and, and new research coming out. The gut microbiome is um, the information. The reason why I'm doing a whole episode on it is because it's really the information that ties all of our specialties together. It really is the gut microbiome is really the definition of you are what you eat. And the health of your gut microbiome is important for your heart. It's important for your kidneys. It's important for your gut. It's important for your brain. It's important for everything. So it's really fascinating. Um, and so, yeah, we'll definitely, I have a whole episode coming up soon just about that. So moving forward, some more uh, questions we have are about kidney stones. So first thing people ask is, you know, what is the evidence of plant-based nutrition? Um, can it help with kidney stones? Yeah. So I, there's at least eight, maybe more questions on kidney stones from what I, you know, uh, aggregated and pulled together. Uh, so we're, we're going to take a few moments here to, to really debug this and answer these questions. Great. So um, within the field of nephrology, the best evidence for plant-based diets is in blood pressure, as we talked about with the DASH diet, great randomized control trial that was redone. But then right after that, it's probably within the literature regarding kidney stones. And, and, I, and most people don't know that. And I didn't fully appreciate that until I wanted to do renal fellowship. And there's one thing we know is that animal protein causes kidney stones. And the reason being is that animal protein has uh, a higher sulfur, has a higher proportion of sulfur-based amino acids that acidify the urine. And uh, this, this acidification of the urine, a lowering of the pH, promotes the formation of kidney stones. Um, and this has been shown in, in several studies. And for, for not, not all kidney stones are the same. So we're, again, we're talking about the bulk of people. So the bulk of people ha with kidney stones are generally having calcium oxalate stones. And, and eating animal protein seems to promote the development of these types of stones, which is really interesting. And the way it does is that you have both calcium and oxalate in your urine, these two, these two uh, uh, separate substances. And when you have this acidic urine, they uh, come together, form, they crystallize, and they form a stone. But if your urine pH is a little bit higher, meaning it's more basic uh, or towards it being more basic, then your likelihood of uh, these substances coming together, forming crystal, becoming a stone is less. Uh, so it's going back to chemistry from high school, uh, the acidity of the urine affects the solubility of these substances. And so if you think about chemistry, what are the other things that can affect the development of a kidney stone? It is the concentration of these substances, which is easily... Well, I shouldn't say easily because it can be difficult to stay hydrated, but it, it, in theory, it's easily is easy to reduce the concentration of these substances by just drinking more water. If you drink more water, you make more urine, and then you can, for example, if you double your urine, you can have your concentration of these substances. Uh, so if you're able to reduce the concentration of these substances, they're less likely to become super saturated in the urine and then precipitate and then uh, form a kidney stone. And then the other big thing that's associated with it is reducing the amount of salt you take in. Salt, which we don't, we don't think about because we hear, oh, it's a calcium oxalate stone. I need to reduce the amount of calcium or the amount of oxalate, which we're going to talk about momentarily. And it has to entirely, that's not entirely correct. But what I do want to say is that what we do know is that if you eat too much salt, that increases the amount of calcium in your urine. And you shouldn't be eating that much salt anyways, like we talked about with high blood pressure. You 
shouldn't be eating that much salt if you've had a kidney stone either because the salt you take in ultimately gets peed out and then it also increases the amount of calcium that you have in your urine which then can form a calcium oxalate stone so for all those reasons um dietary change is important and if you've had a kidney stone or a risk for developing one and the other thing i want to say is that plant protein on the other hand reduces the risk of developing a kidney stone because it's high it's several substances that we think are beneficial for preventing kidney stones. One is potassium, and the other is citrate. Citrate, which is also found in citrus fruit, is converted to bicarbonate, which is a base by the liver. It's a basic substance. So although citrus fruits are acidic, they turn the urine more alkaline because of the citrate. And what happens is that uh, you can find citrate in a variety of plant-based foods, uh, in, in fruits and vegetables of all kinds. And it may not be citrate, it may be other forms of natural alkali or natural bases. And what the, what these people, uh, what, what people say is that these foods reduce the acidity of the urine. They make it more neutral or more towards being more basic. And this prevents the formation of at least calcium oxalate stones. In theory, you can overdo it and then put yourself at risk for calcium phosphate stones. But the bulk of people, uh, generally have calcium oxalate stones and most people aren't at risk of developing calcium phosphate stones by overdoing it unless there's some other issue going on. Uh, so for most people, they're generally okay. And then the, if, if you're, if you Google this, you'll see this last recommendation, which some plant based nephrologists have an issue with, which is the recommendation that you should also be eating dairy to prevent kidney stones. And I'm going to explain this. Is that like an old wives' tale that dairy helps with preventing kidney stones? Where does that even come from? Yeah, so it comes from it comes from several studies uh, and and also from theoretical evidence that calcium in the dairy start to bind oxalate in the intestine. So you have to take a step back a little bit and, and think about this. And I'll, I'll tell you what people say out there officially, and I'll tell you my thoughts on this and why I don't personally advocate people to focus on dairy or focus on getting calcium from dairy because you can get calcium from other places. So just take a step back. In order to form a calcium oxalate stone in your urine, that calcium oxalate has to get there by what you eat. It just doesn't appear there magically. So uh, you generally eat calcium and you eat oxalate and, and then these foods get absorbed. People think that if you eat dairy, the calcium in the dairy binds oxalate in the intestine from foods that have oxalate. Um, and there are certain foods that have it, and a lot of foods ha have oxalate in them. And what they're saying is that if you bind, if the, if the calcium in the dairy binds oxalate in the intestine, it doesn't even get absorbed, and then it just gets pooped out. And then people who don't eat dairy, there's no calcium, so the oxalate is then absorbed, and then you, you pee out the oxalate instead of pooping it out. But the, these studies were done of people who are eating animal-based diets. So that, that's kind of interesting. People, people no, one, no one's really looked at people eating plant-based diets. And and seeing if this association holds true, because I wonder if this is even an issue. So a lot of this comes from the, the study called the Borgi study, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, that followed people for five years. And uh, because it showed that eating dairy reduced your intake, uh, uh, reduced your risk of developing calcium oxalate stones, uh, sorry, uh, eating dairy reduced your risk of developing calcium oxalate stones, it's made it its way into uh, recommendations for many people treating stone disease. But the other issue is regarding fat because fat uh, plays a role in the absorption of these things too. Because if too much fat in your diet will bind calcium and then it will render oxygen in your intestine to be free to be absorbed. And like I said, no one's really tested this on a low-fat plant-based diet. If you're eating a low-fat plant-based diet, there's less calcium to bind fat or there's less ca calcium being bound to fat. And so that calcium in theory should be free to bind oxalate again. And then, so the only way around this is if you eat too much fat is to eat more calcium. And then, which may be why the official party line of those people in the stone community is to eat calcium. So why do you believe that dairy is not necessary to prevent kidney stones? I think people eating plant-based diets have an int altered intestinal absorption, metabolism, and urinary chemistry. Like I said, they're are generally eating lower fat diets, which affects how what calcium is binding to and if that calcium is free to bind to oxalate. And then more importantly, people eating plant-based diets uh, may be also getting calcium from plant-based sources, making this issue of eating dairy not important, but we, we just don't know. So I think there's a lot of questions out there. So uh, of the recommendations that 
people say for if you have kidney stones to hydrate, eat animal, as animal protein, and avoid salt. I agree with all those three. The fourth one is getting calcium from dairy. That one uh, I don't stick to as well because I think those studies were done in people eating the general moderate to high fat diets in American diet, and they weren't done in people eating plant based diets. So those those are my caveats with that. So that being said. People ask me all the time, should I reduce calcium intake if I have a calcium oxalate stone? And the answer is no. And I mentioned that, and you can go back to the, the Bore Key study, which just does look at calcium. And again, it was done in people generally eating animal protein. Uh, you shouldn't avoid calcium, but you shouldn't go crazy. Another thing is you shouldn't also get calcium in the form of supplements. You should try and get it from food. You can get it from plant-based food. Uh, a number of green leafy vegetables are rich in calcium. And then the other question I get is about oxalate, and people hear that many plant-based foods have too much oxalate, and should I reduce the amount of oxalate I take it? For example, I hear all the time, uh, should I avoid eating spinach, for example, because I have had calcium oxalate stones? So this is where I shed some light on my own uh, personal history. I've had a calcium oxalate my, uh, stone myself. Uh, I had it in high school, and the only time well, actually, one of a few times. The other time, uh, I was at the beach and I wasn't uh, hydrating appropriately. And as you can see, if you don't hydrate, you can put yourself at risk. But the the the, the first time I had it put me in the ER because it was uh, a, fair, a very large stone, and I was eating. I went out of my way to eat a very animal protein heavy, non plant based diet, and I think that was ultimately the cause of my my kidney stone. And I was also high in sodium too, and I may not have been drinking much water as I was in high school in Florida, Florida being hot. But uh, I have since eaten spinach a lot since going plant-based, and I haven't had a, a kidney stone since then, uh, except for that one boat day encounter. But, um, and I know it's anecdotal, but what the, what the literature showed is that people uh, limiting oxalate has, it has not been shown to reduce stone risk. And that's because not everyone eating a lot of oxalate has a lot of oxalate in the urine. That, it depends on what is binding the oxalate in the gut? Is it calcium? Is it uh, something else? And so the only people that I have concerns about that eat a lot of oxalate in their diet are these people who have an established elevated urine concentration of oxalate in their urine. So the only way you can know this is if you do a 24-hour urine collection, and that 24-hour urine collection shows that you have a lot of oxalate in your urine. It's called hyperoxaluria, meaning like, too much oxalate in the urine. So for those people, I, I counsel them on uh, limiting certain foods that would increase the amount of oxalate here. But the vast majority of people reducing the amount of, for example, rhubarb, spinach, potatoes, almonds, chocolate, peanuts, these are all high oxalate foods, reducing the amount of those foods has not been shown to reduce the amount, reduce the own risk, which is ultimately important. Right. So essentially then, I mean, based on the mechanisms you just described, essentially being hydrated and sticking to a low fat whole food plant-based diet would eliminate a lot of the mechanisms that put you at risk for developing kidney stones. You're absolutely right. So I tell people the big three for if you've had a kidney stone is drink more water, cut back on the salt and cut back on the animal protein. And that will get you more than halfway there. And then the other thing is that for people who still are doing that or can't do that or aren't making, are still getting stones for a reason, we sometimes prescribe people potassium citrate in a pill form, which is really interesting because potassium is found in plants and so is citrate. So we're essentially taking these two components found in plants, putting it in a pill form, writing a specific dose and telling people take this twice a day, three times a day. And it's and literally, it's, it's a, it's, these are plant-based components. So I think it's really interesting and just underscores how plants are useful, even for kidney stone treatment. That's, fa that's really interesting because it is a, a common issue that people, um, we got asked this question a lot, and it's a common issue with a lot of misconceptions out there. And I'm really glad we cleared that up because really, I mean, a lot of different areas um, with regards to nephrology and kidney disease can be helped and improved with plant-based nutrition, but specifically with regards to kidney stones, I mean, the evidence is just there. Just increasing your water intake, decreasing your animal protein intake, and decreasing your salt alone. If you follow a, a whole food plant-based diet that's low in fat and you keep hydrated, a lot of these issues and a lot of these mechanisms, you know, will be prevented. So it's it's fascinating. The next question I want to talk about, which everyone um, has definitely 
asked nonstop about, and I think that you uh, being a nephrologist will be able to well answer this, is the protein issue. So how much protein are people supposed to limit in chronic kidney disease? And is too much protein bad for your kidneys? Yeah, so we probably got a half dozen questions on this. And that's no surprise because this is a question that has been debated for decades within the professional literature amongst nephrologists. People, I've seen people yell about this, get very heated <laughs> and emotional. This is where people really, you know, sit on the edge of their chair because this is something that nephrologists have been wondering for a long time. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll save you the long story, but I'll give you the, the high points. So, so the question, one of the, one of the questions is how much protein to limit in the CKD and chronic kidney disease? And I heard too much protein is bad for your kidneys. Is this true or false? So my answer is it depends. And this is uh, a complicated issue. If you don't have kidney disease, it may not be so bad, but most people with kidney disease don't know they have it. So unless you're absolutely sure you don't have kidney disease, uh, you've had your blood and urine checked and you don't have kidney disease, then you're probably okay. But there is some epidemiologic evidence, epidemiological evidence coming from the ERIC study, that's A-R-I-C, and then the Nurses Health Study, and then the Singapore Chinese Health Study, suggesting that people eating red meat are associated with a higher risk of developing kidney disease. So it's and for people without kidney disease, there are some associative studies. I'm not saying they're causal, they're just associations that people eating red meat do have a little bit higher risk of developing kidney disease. And now is that a, a factor of also the foods they're eating? Is it the sodium? Is it unhealthy lifestyles? We don't know because these are, these are broad population studies. They aren't trials testing one uh, variable against uh, a control, but it, it is something worth thinking about. So, and then um, the, so going into the issue with if you, what to do if you have kidney disease, and a couple of people asked um, uh, what to do if you've donated a kidney, and then what if you have stage three kidney disease? Protein restriction. So limiting amount of protein has been shown to be beneficial in patients with established kidney disease. And again, this is very controversial, and I can already hear the tomatoes flying at me from <laughs> in your from your podcast audience the throwing them. <laughs> Um, but, uh, there is, there are several pieces of information that are important to note. So I'm just going to get it out of the way. So there was a giant trial done called MDRD, which tested, uh, people on a low protein diet. It basically it, it recruited uh, a number of people and it tested them eating lower protein, uh, compared to more protein. And what this diet showed is that after, I believe it was around three years, um, people on this diet did not have a change in the progression of kidney disease. So people say, well, if this file showed this, uh, then uh, there's no benefit. But the thing is, is that there was a lot of critiques about this trial, and namely that the number of the patients that it recruited were people that generally are amenable to dietary therapy. The, it included a disproportionate number of people that had polycystic kidney disease, for example, which is thought to be a hereditary condition that's progressive and not affected by diet. So uh, people, so if anything, it showed that perhaps people with polycystic kidney disease may not benefit from a uh, protein restricted diet, but it doesn't answer the question. What about your average person with, you know, the number one, number two causes of kidney disease, which is diabetes and hypertension. What about those people? And so this question still lingers. And then when there was a secondary analysis, it showed that there perhaps is a small benefit. So, and then there's a number of trials and there's even a meta-analysis showing that there is benefit of people restricting their protein intake and it's made its way into the guidelines and even people debate like what are the numbers it should be and the debate even rages. I was even reading some papers about it today that were recently published and how it's very controversial. But a number of people, I'm not going to say everyone, but a number of nephrologists out there do agree that protein restriction is beneficial if you already have chronic kidney disease. Let's, let's like, I mean, at least the elephant in the room that everyone knows, and we discuss on multiple podcast episodes, is our nation has this obsession, this protein obsession. And we all get far too much protein, far more protein than we actually need. And so, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, make sense that we continue to focus in general with regards to the whole diet space and wellness space on just getting so much protein. I mean, we at least from the cardiovascular data know that higher amounts of animal protein specifically are um, definitely associated with higher all-cause mortality. So 
I just, I think that at least with regards to the cardiology space, you know, the, the concern for our nation's protein obsession is strong. You know, we don't need that much protein. And in general, everyone is getting far more protein than they actually require. Right, right, exactly. And uh, one of the theorized adverse effects of each which protein in the kidney is that it causes hyperfiltration. So people think that the too much protein it revs up the kidney. And for people that already have kidney disease, their ability to repair the kidney to not sustain damage is limited, meaning that it's kind of like if you have uh, your your engine on an old car that already you know has already broken down a couple times and is a little worn out, and then you throw in something else, some other issue, maybe the oil is low or something, you know that engine may not be able to withstand all these problems as perhaps an engine that doesn't have pre-existing problems. So it's right. kind of a very rudimentary comparison, but that's kind of the idea. And um, people, so this is, has made its way into the guidelines. And uh, for people that have uh, CKD stages one through three A, so this three A and it goes down to a GFR glomerular filtration rate of around forty five mLs per minute for people that have their know their numbers or have their lab reports out. So that's roughly equivalent to about forty five percent kidney function. It is generally thought to you should limit your maximum amount of protein to about one gram per kilogram per day. Uh, based on an ideal body weight. And then for people that have stages KD3B to stage 5, you want to limit it a little bit more, meaning you want to eat a little bit less uh, because your kidney is a little bit more vulnerable because you have advanced kidney disease. So the, the recommendation is to limit to about 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. And then if you're on dialysis, meaning that if you've had kid, if you have kidney failure, the idea is that your kidneys are kind of toast. And you don't have much kidneys to preserve, so they say you can go back up to eating uh, 1.2 to 1.4 grams per kilogram per day. And even today, I was just real reading an editorial how that number is contested, and you should at least eat more than a gram uh, of per kilogram per day. But uh, the idea is that in dialysis, you're losing some proteins uh, through actual dialysis because you're reconnected to the machine, and then some of those proteins get lost in the, the filters, and then even in the blood that's lost in the machine when you disconnect. So they say you need to be a little bit better fed in terms of protein to account for that. That's really interesting because, you know, in general, um, you know, the requirements for people with CKD are pretty similar to the requirements for the standard person, right? So for a regular individual without any CKD needs about 0.8 grams per kilogram of healthy body weight. Um, So the average protein requirement is about 42 grams. Um, And meat eaters and vegetarians in numerous studies have been found that they get at least 75 grams on average. So everybody is getting about 70% more protein than they need. You're absolutely right. And, uh, and and not not to toot my own horn, but uh, I, with several great uh, physicians, wrote this paper talking about this. No one had really summed up these points, and we just right. published this in the journal Real Nutrition. Congrats! Uh, thank you. And how plant protein and kidney disease is not only adequate in terms of quantity and quality, but it also may be beneficial. And we're going to talk about those those benefits shortly. But you bring up a great point. The amount of protein you should be eating is the amount of protein that we recommend for people with stage 3, CKD3, B to 5. It's only the higher numbers that people are getting into protein excess. So it's really, it's not truly protein restriction. It's just avoiding protein excess if you have kidney disease. So if anyone has any questions or wants to learn more, there's a great uh, review article published by Cam Kalantarizade, who I'm honored to call friends. And uh, he's at UC Irvine, and uh, he published his New England Journal of Medicine in November 2017. It's a nice review, and it sums up all these points. Thank you for um, sharing that, because I think there's like a lot of confusion in this space for uh, patients and nephrologists, so and for medicine physicians, for everyone. So that was very useful. And so now the next step is that we were asked quite a lot is, what's the best source of protein for those that already have CKD? Yeah, so I, and again, not to, to toot my horn, but I bring up these points uh, with my co-authors in this paper that, that we just wrote. We, we say it's plant protein. We think that animal protein, you don't really need it as long as you're eating a balanced diet. You can get adequate amounts of protein, even more through plant-based foods. And the plant-based foods have this added benefit, what I call bonus benefits in kidney disease because they reduce blood pressure, which we talked about in the DASH diet. They also do have this effect on affecting the pH, which we talked about with the kidney stones. 
This is really important in people with CKD because your ability to keep the pH normal is limited in patients with kidney disease. Uh, your kidneys take on that function, and as your kidney function declines, your, their ability to do this is, is decreased. And people talk about alkaline water. Should I drink alkaline water? I tell people, no, you should eat alkaline food. You should, alkaline food are fruits and vegetables. These foods tend to have uh, natural alkali. And there's been several studies done. For anyone interested by this, you should look up uh, Don Wesson and his trials. He's done uh, at least three studies. Uh, he's done more, uh, but the, there's uh, three big ones. There's a stage uh, one and two CKD where he studied people for 30 days, uh, a three-year uh, stage three CKD study, and then a, uh, a, a one-year stage four CKD study where he basically randomized, uh, at least in stage three and stage four, patients on to either sodium bicarb to treat which is baking soda to treat their low ph in their in their blood or fruits and vegetables and when he showed that he basically tested this idea out you don't have to take my word or you know this is not an old wives tale there are really natural alkali in fruits and vegetables and these patients all they had to eat were two to four cups uh per day um uh which to equal the amount of sodium bicarb that the control group was eating and they were able to neutralize their pH. They were able to reduce all the negative effects that happen with metabolic acidosis, which includes CKD progression, uh, leaching of calcium and phosphate from the bones, and, and so many other things. So they were able to literally replace a medicine with food and show that you can maintain your pH, which is truly amazing. So that's the second bonus benefit that I talk about in plant protein with CKD. Third one is less phosphate absorption. And the fourth one is a microbiome which we kind of touched on. Uh, the phosphate issue, most people don't know what uh, phosphate is or pay attention to it or think about it with their diet, but phosphate is very poor for people with kidney disease and it's difficult for them and there's a huge push now amongst advocacy societies to get this labeling on uh, nutrition uh, labels on, on food so people can understand how much phosphate is in foods, but it's kind of like this missing uh, uh, nutrient that we don't right. that we don't pay uh, pay attention to, but for people with chronic kidney disease, it is uh, literally a huge burden for them. So, uh, what, what phos high phosphate levels deposit with calcium and basically cause a calcification or hardening of the blood vessels, and this has been shown to to be bad in in several instances. And uh, so, this is why we reinforce. Um, people to limit the amount of phosphate they eat. And sometimes that's not enough, and we have to tell people to take food that bind the phosphate in their gut called phosphate binders. That's interesting. I mean, I think actually the most shocking thing that you just mentioned was with regards to the metabolic acidosis. I mean, I had no idea that three cups of fruits and vegetables equals sodium bicarb that you could, instead of you know providing your patients with chronic repletion of sodium bicarb, you can actually have them improve this with regards to just increasing fruits and vegetables. That's really, really interesting. It, it is very interesting. And even, even as a nephrologist, we don't, we don't really pay attention to or discuss it too much. And I don't know why it, perhaps it's almost as a bias because it's not, it's literally not a medicine that we think, Oh, it's, you know, this is, you know, not a, you can't do this for everyone. And, you know, it's not really, it's real. But it, it is real. These are published. Uh, these are randomized controlled trials with long durations, and it showed. And it, and it fits it because most of the acid load we get from our foods actually comes from animal protein. Yeah. Do you mind explaining that too? How animal protein kind of makes increases our acid load? Yeah. So it goes back to what I was talking about with the stone. So animal protein, all proteins made of amino acids, but it's amino acid composition. The amino acids in animal protein tend to have a more sulfur based. Uh, have a, have a higher amounts of sulfur-based moieties or these uh, areas that have sulfur in them on the amino acids that ultimately get converted to sulfuric acid and then cause uh, acidosis, which is just the phenomenon of acidification of blood, but then ultimately acidemia, which is the decrease in the pH or decrease in bicarb that you see in the blood work. So it, it all goes down to the amino acids and uh, fruits and vegetables don't have these, uh, or at least a high proportion of these sulfur-based amino acids, and they also have natural alkali like like cit like citrate, um, which is found not only in citrus but also many other fruits and vegetables. And what uh, Don Wesson and Nimrit Garaya and uh, all these researchers showed is that um, you can effectively treat patients that have problems maintaining their pH with CKD one, two, three, and four 
by just giving them on average three cups of fruits and vegetables per day. Wow. That yeah. is so cool. That is brilliant. I've actually not ever heard of this. And I, I feel like a lot of nephrologists may not know this because this seems like information that hasn't been too publicized. And it's really, really interesting. We kind of just get in the habit of prescribing medications and not prescribing fruits and vegetables, which I know is not something uh, that you stand by, of course, or me either. But um, I definitely did not know this. This is really eye opening. Yeah, I, I agree. And then the people that were eating fruits and vegetables also had lower blood pressures because they were getting the sodium. They also had weight loss because they were eating more fiber, they're eating less calories. Uh, so there is there's additional benefits. So we talk about food being medicine in a lot of ways, but it really is it can help you in many aspects. Wow. Well, next up that everyone has been asking are, um, I really wanted to discuss what your thoughts are about can a whole food plant based diet cause high uric acid levels in the body? That was a question that we got a couple times and pretty unique question and, and interesting topic. Right. Yeah. So the, the answer is no. So gout and high uric acid levels generally come from eating organ meats, seafood, um, meat in general, and then also alcohol, uh, which I know alcohol is plant based. So moderate your intake for those who like the occasional uh, beer now and then. But uh, but in terms of whole food plant-based diets, uh, there's a couple people that I draw uh, on for expertise on this. So uh, both Brenda Davis and Michael Greger have both uh, written about this and they have uh, websites uh, going into this. But uh, diets rich in plant food are not associated with increased risk of gout, even when there's a higher purine content in plant-based Foods because for whatever reason, uh, the higher purines uh, don't ultimately uh, lead to gout or elevated uric acid levels, which is interesting and good to know because we generally think of plant foods as being beneficial, animal foods as not, but this is just another area where it's really important to look at the food and just not the, the component within the food because how the component of the food, like for example, purines is absorbed, metabolized, and eliminated from the body is is different than with animal foods. Right. Absolutely. Well, people often ask about cleanses and uh, you must in nephrology get asked about this a lot. Oh God. <laughs> cleanses are all the rage. And um, anyone listening, as you know, your body gets detoxified from your liver and your kidneys. They do all of the cleansing um, we need to, to do. But what are your thoughts about organ specific cleansing? cleanses that people. no either i mean th there is this is just uh this is just fake oil this is uh, news, uh right? the, the only cleansing that's happening is to your wallet <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah i do not advocate for them I do not support them i try to stick to evidence-based literature so if it hasn't you know published in a respectable journal with the corpus of evidence surrounding it i i won't even touch it um and a lot of these are just more wishful thinking than any actual sound science agreed me i totally agreed um our bodies are doing the cleansing on their own without the purchase of any sort of lemon water mix right um, so generally i know that we kind of covered this but just to cover it again just to get wrapped up so does a plant-based diet help with kidney function? So this is a few fold of questions. So what foods can we eat for the healthiest kidneys possible? And what are the most important things we can do within our diet to help keep our kidneys healthy? And, you know, in general, what is a kidney healthy diet? Yeah, so I think kidney healthy diet is a diet that minimizes your risk for developing kidney disease. So if you think about number one, number two cause of kidney failure being diabetes and hypertension respectively, if you eat a diet that prevents development of those diseases, you will ultimately uh, uh, prevent your your risk of developing complications of those diseases that lead to kidney failure. It makes sense. You can't have diabetic kidney disease or hypertensive kidney disease if you don't right. have diabetes or hypertension in the first place. Absolutely. And so what does that mean? I, that means eating a plant-based diet. Plant-based diets are great. They're high in fiber, low in sodium, high in potassium. They have the natural alkali that I was talking about, vitamins, minerals antioxidants. Uh, these foods are really helpful. They help maintain normal weight. They help maintain normal glycemic metabolism, uh, a normal blood pressure. They help on multiple levels. And uh, those foods that uh, do that help prevent disease that ultimately lead to disease. Um, so that's what I tell people. And then even if you do have kidney disease, like we talked about earlier, 
uh, plant-based diets can be can be helpful for those bonus bonus benefits that I mentioned in terms of treating blood pressure, uh, acidosis in the blood, and high phosphate levels. Wow, that makes a lot of sense, and that's actually very useful information. So overall, all of the ways that we specifically can improve our total body health by preventing cardiovascular disease, um, diabetes, autoimmune disease through plant-based nutrition, obviously ends up helping our kidneys as well. Exactly. And there's no specific food. So people ask me, oh, what about kale or carrots or this or that? And it's no specific plant food. It's, it's plant foods in general. So you don't have to worry about, oh, I don't have you know, sweet potatoes and I haven't been able to get to them. It's, it's all plant foods. So as long as you're eating a plant-based diet, you're, you're likely in the clear. Great. Well, uh, another question we had was, well, can someone on hemodialysis with end-stage renal failure eat a 100% plant-based diet? Yeah. So people on NSA with end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis need to watch their diet more so than anyone out there because what goes in doesn't truly come out because your kidneys don't don't work and the, the dialysis takes over for that the dial you, dialysis is like i was saying earlier it's a machine that you get connected to it's a it's a crude and uh, almost barbaric process and that you have to put needles into someone and connect them and then the blood flows out of the body into a machine which filters in and flows the blood back into the body and uh, this happens for four hours uh three times a week which is um imagine trying to schedule something that frequently it's hard to you know sit down and meet up with a friend for you know a dinner or lunch here and there but to do this three times a week four hours a time is difficult people on hemodialysis definitely need to watch uh what they eat and uh can you eat 100 percent plant-based diet yes there are some small studies showing this and there weren't any complications. There's even some benefits in that these people were actually uh, able to eat more food, stay in a better nutrition state than those not eating plant-based diets. But the quality of the evidence is, is not great. Uh, there's not a lot of studies. There's small amounts of people, meaning so that we can't come out in the open and say that, yes, everyone should be doing this or this is totally recommended by the major societies. This is an area of active interest that we have to look into. But there is no contraindication just for someone doing this in general however if there's a specific contraindication for that person then it's best to listen to your team and that or your uh, healthcare providers which goes without saying for all aspects of of uh, healthcare and treatment if you should always do what your doctor tells you but um, things to watch out for is uh, potassium levels and uh, protein levels but i i know this better than anyone because i wrote the paper on this uh <laughs> a few months ago is that protein levels are fine and people that eat plant-based diets on dialysis and then potassium levels, which has historically been a big concern. But even in those people in the, in those uh, pH studies, eating the three cups of fruits and vegetables per day and they had stage four CKD, there was no elevated potassium levels seen in people eating uh, that amount of plant food. And actually What's interesting is that no study has ever shown that eating plant-based foods has uh, raises potassium. There are a couple of case reports out there, um, but uh, no well-done study like a randomized control trial or uh, even an observational cohort that has shown that uh, eating plant-based foods raises potassium or reducing my plant-based foods reduces potassium. And the reason being is because uh, potassium plant-based foods as it goes back to the, the, the uric acid issue and the periods in, uh, with plant-based foods is that the way these substances are absorbed, metabolized, and extruded in the body is different depending on the food. And, right. and with, when you eat potassium in plant-based foods, if you're eating a banana or having a salad, you're getting a lot of fiber, and that fiber increases your bowel, increases the frequency of bowel movements, and with each bowel movement, you're losing potassium. So this may be one reason why people eating plant-based foods don't have a rise in potassium or always have a rise in potassium. That makes perfect sense. And, and, you know, and at the bottom line, what we can say in general with research is that although a plant-based end-stage renal study has not been randomized to versus standard American diet, at the, at the very least, we can say, I mean, there's nothing in animal meat or dairy or cheese that someone with end-stage renal disease needs to survive. If anything, there are many reasons why it can only 
make you more ill and um, make your gut microbiome much more unhealthy. But there's nothing that someone with kidney disease needs from animal products to live a healthy life. Right, right. And um, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the, only, the only caveat that I might throw in is with vitamin B12, but most people on dialysis are already on uh, some sort of renal vitamin because uh, many vitamins are filtered off in dialysis. So, but other than that, you're, you're absolutely right. What's with that saying? Vitamin B12, I, I say this episode to episode, you know, I always recommend no matter how much people are eating fortified foods, everyone supplements B12. Right. And even people that are eating animal-based foods still may have low vitamin B12 levels for a variety of reasons. So it's not always the case, but in the studies, it has been shown that people eating plant-based diets do have a little bit lower vitamin B12 levels than, than those not eating um, plant-based diets. But all, but the, the, at the end of the day, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Yeah, people, I think people can greatly benefit by switching to a plant-based diet uh, for all the reasons that we mentioned. And if, if people on dialysis are on a number of medications, I think personally to counteract or balance the effects of an animal-based diet, which high phosphate levels, low bicarb levels, blood pressure medications. If you could switch to a plant-based diet and get off a couple of medications or even one medication, that's a huge, it's a huge gain. Huge gain. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was so, so, so useful and so helpful because kidney disease, as we talked about, is kind of gets overlooked sometimes and it's important. It's very important. And quality of life and the fact that we can really improve a lot of the factors that go into kidney disease are very important, especially with with prevention and with nutrition. The only question I, that we didn't hit on that I really did want to ask is, can kidney failure be reversed? So anything regarding um, renal failure with the foods that can help you essentially, is it possible to reverse kidney disease? Right, right. So yeah, so um, and then uh, I, uh, I got sidetracked in answering a potassium question. So I'll just finish that one up. Um, so as I mentioned, increasing your bowel movement can lower your uh, potassium levels or, pre- or prevent absorption of right. potassium. And then natural alkali, that bicarb can also lower your potassium level. And then also having better control of your glucose, uh, which generally happens with plant based diets causes potassium to uh, go into the cell and basically not cause uh, potassium to rise in the actual bloodstream when you check it in a blood test. So there's a variety of reasons that potassium is uh, uh, beneficial. So the, now going back to, to your last question, uh, which is very important. So can plant-based diets reverse uh, kidney disease? There is very limited evidence showing this, but and it's circumstantial. And uh, again, not, not not to toot my own horn, but I did <laughs> but just to but just to show that this is you know an an active interest uh both within the field and of mine and it's not really well developed is that I presented on this at the uh, National Kidney Foundation in 2018 and that their uh, spring clinical meeting in Austin uh, on this very subject so there is a study uh, from the New England Journal of Medicine and it talks about how people with type one diabetes so. Uh, again, this is a type of diabetes that's not thought to be related to uh, exercise or diet, in, in this, at least in the same way as type 2 diabetes, but uh, people with type 1 diabetes who got pancreas transplant. So this is uh, so the idea of type 1 diabetes is that your, your body attacks the pancreas, the pancreas doesn't work. So if you give someone a new pancreas, the pancreas should work and uh, their diabetes should go away. And indeed, that's what happened. And in the study from the England Journal of Medicine, they showed that People who got this pancreas transplant and already had diabetic kidney disease, who had these changes on pathology and under, after having a, my, a kidney biopsy, when looking at the microscope, they saw these changes in the kidney. These changes went away after five wow. to 10 years of having normal glucose levels after a pancreas transplant. So you, can kind of, yeah, so you can kind of see where I'm going with this. So if it can happen in a type 1 diabetic that got a pancreas transplant, could you do the same in a type 2 diabetic with lifestyle change, with a diet, with exercise, with losing weight? And that's what I theorized. And the, the, the poster got accepted, and it wasn't anything more. And it, it's just a, a, a concept of this. And uh, I think it, it potentially could be possible. No one has done it, but maybe this will be you know, the big study of, uh, of our generation that shows that you could potentially reverse 
type 2 diabetic kidney disease through a plant-based diet. The, the caveat being is that you would have to have normal glucose levels for 5 to 10 years. Right, right. That's unreal. That's actually so interesting. I mean, the mechanism and the fact that the, that with a pancreas transplant that they were able to see those changes, it only makes me think that you know, the actual mechanism is the same if you're reversing diabetes with lifestyle. Uh, this is just obviously us discussing it. This isn't, you know, based on any evidence other than, you know, what you had just presented, but it's fascinating, the concept. I mean, it makes total sense. Right, right. It, it is It is super fascinating and interesting. And uh, I kind of wish there was, in, in all saltfish, have said someone had already done these studies, so I don't have to wonder, but it is extremely <laughs> fascinating. You know, I, I really do think that this was really helpful because there's a lot with kidney disease that can be helped with lifestyle modification. And I think that we're kind of on the cusp of lifestyle modification being a big focus for a lot of areas of different subspecialties. And I'm glad that you're kind of spearheading that in nephrology. Um, so essentially, the takeaway from this is that uh, being on a whole food plant based diet can only help keep your kidneys healthy. Um, and Regardless, at every stage of kidney disease, you recommend a healthful diet to help the person live their healthiest life. Right, exactly. And uh, I believe that. And I want to mention about all the wonderful things that uh, that we're doing in our plant-based uh, lifestyle clinic uh, at Bellevue, which I am uh, fortunate enough to be a part of. And it's uh, led and uh, organized by Dr. Michelle McMacken. Uh, who I know you know, and uh, your your uh, audience listeners also know as well. It is a truly a wonderful program that uh, the city of New York and so many people are supporting and believe in because after all these studies that we mentioned, and not only the ones we mentioned in this podcast, but so many other podcasts of people in the field that you've had, uh, we know plant-based diets are helpful and beneficial. So we have this program uh, at Bellevue, which is uh, one of America's largest, oldest, oldest public hospitals. And uh, for people that have prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, excess weight, which is overweight or obesity, high cholesterol, heart disease, they can come to our clinic. And we have a wonderful health coach uh, named Chris Ann and dietitian named Lily who work with the physicians like myself and Dr. McMacken and our other two physicians who are also great, Dr. Uh, Garab Sharma and Dr. Sapna Shah. We all work together to help patients make these lifestyle changes to reduce the extent of the disease they had and in some cases reverse the disease that they have. It's amazing. And it is truly amazing. And um, if anyone's interested or is in the area or wants to refer a friend, uh, I'll give that number now. Uh, so just get a pen and paper. Uh, but that number is 347-507-3695 uh, to schedule. And again, that number is 347-507-3695. I, I mean, you know that so Michelle McMacken's one of my best friends. So I am so jealous that on a day to day basis, you get to work with Michelle and what you guys are doing is just unbelievable and outstanding. And I really am. I just got to applaud Bellevue and, um, you know, New York for being so supportive of your program. And it's just, it's really going to help a lot of patients. So if anyone's in the New York area and you want to see this fantastic group of internists and nephrologists who can help you with your lifestyle medicine and prevention of disease through their plant-based uh, group, you definitely should take advantage of it and try to get an appointment. So where can everyone find you on social media? Yeah, so people can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under uh, my handle, which is uh, at S Joshi M D. It's S J O S H I M D. That's my first initial and last name, and then uh, my title M D. And uh, that is uh, the same for both uh, for all three: Instagram, uh, Facebook, and uh, Twitter. Uh, I am most active on Twitter, uh, just uh, out of personal preference. It's easy for me to share studies on my laptop and interface, but. Uh, I am uh, a little bit on Facebook and a little bit on Instagram, although, uh, although Instagram is a mix of personal and professional things. And I also have a website that is uh, very basic. It's nothing fancy. I uh, do this on my spare time, and I don't have uh, any funding or anything to, to make it any better. 
Uh, but um, it's it's just a way for me to put studies or things that I find interesting. So I have some resources on articles I've written before. Yeah, and actually, we have to. I have to um, definitely pump this up because you guys should read Shabam's articles. They're they're so good. You have so many. You've written so many great articles from keto to paleo to like a lot of different topics that are interesting in nutrition um, with a ton of journal citations and information. So. Where, what's your website that everyone can find your writing? Yeah, yeah. And thank you. Thank you so much for, for reading. Uh, that's really nice of you to say. Um, yeah, so my website is uh, www.afternoonrounds.com. It's a, a play on words uh, because physicians are always doing morning rounds and we don't get to talk about finer things within medicine or in life. So I thought maybe I would devote a website called Afternoon Rounds, which to discuss these things that we don't obviously or always discuss in morning rounds. But over the years, it's become more and more plant-based as where most of, more and more of my interests and time and effort is spent. And so uh, people will see that uh, my most recent article is on the benefits, risks, and alternatives of the keto diet. And I've cited a bunch of studies uh, there so people can click on it and they're hyperlinked to the actual study. Cool. So anything big from your uh, research standpoint coming out to people for them to keep their eyes peeled? Any nephrology research cooking for you? Yeah, so I'm working on a few things uh, with uh, people all over the country. And the big question that we have is, you know, how bad is animal protein and how good is plant protein? So we're uh, looking at studies to further tease this out. Awesome. Um, we're in the early stages, but uh, uh, keep an eye out. And uh, we should be having a couple of review papers come out in the near future, awesome. and hopefully more over time. So that's why you got to follow Shabam on Twitter so you can see when he tweets out his new papers. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And this was quite educational. And, you know, I think everyone listening, if you're a med school residency or if you're an attending, um, nephrology isn't as painful as you remember, right? I mean, this was pretty painless and um, it gives me a little bit more you know, I now have a fondness for nephrology, I think, after today. <laughs> oh, that, that is that is the biggest the biggest compliment you could pay. I am so glad that I have turned you I have turned you from someone that ran away previously from nephrology ran away, to ran away, perhaps yeah. someone who would just stand still and, and at least considers <laughs> what I'm saying. You made it definitely away. digestible and definitely easy to understand. And um I thank you so much. And everyone listening, thanks for listening to this episode and we will see you next week. Yep, and thank you so much for having me.